Hi kids, how you doing? My name is Jordan Joquil. We're here on Haleakala Ranch. It's a beautiful place you can see up on the mountains. Um, I am a land manager on the ranch at Haleakala Ranch. And so we do a lot more on the ranch besides just raise cows. We have to manage land for those cows. And so what that means is managing for invasive species, managing for native watershed forests, which we'll talk about in a little bit, and also planting koa trees, because koa trees are also a really important crop uh, and an important resource for important, an important thing here in Hawaii. I think you're all familiar with koa trees and koa canoes. So one of the most important things we do here on the ranch, and me as I do as a land manager, is I protect water. So why is water important? We use water for everything we do. We have to drink water every single day of our lives. Most of our body, believe it or not, is made up of water. We use water to brush our teeth, we use water to wash our cars, we use water when we cook and when we boil eggs and we do everything else with water. So a lot of people don't really understand where water comes from, but water doesn't just come from the tap. There's a long journey that water makes before it gets to your sink. And so water falls out of the sky from rain and it hits the land. And when it hits the land, that area is called a watershed. And the most healthy watershed is a native forested watershed. So forest, you guys know what that means, but native means that that forest is made up of trees and ferns and small little plants like you see here that are only from Hawaii. And so this kind of a forest is really, really important to having a healthy watershed. It's got what we call a healthy canopy. That's the top, that's the roof of the forest. And that slows the water down. It's got what we call a sub canopy. That's all the trees that are shorter than the tallest trees that also help put shade on the ground. And underneath that, we have a real thick ground cover of ferns and mosses and all of those together, they act like a sponge to hold that water together. And if we didn't have a healthy watershed, what would happen is all of that water would just run off into the ocean. It would make our oceans dirty and brown and we couldn't swim. And we wouldn't be able to harvest that water in streams or underwater with wells so that we could use it to brush our teeth and to drink water every day. So this is an example of a native tree. This is called an ohia tree. And you guys have probably seen these ohia lehua. This is a beautiful yellow, they call them mamo um, in Hawaiian for the yellow tree. But this is just one example of one of the most important trees uh, in a native Hawaiian rainforest in, in a watershed. But one of the big problems today in, in, with our, our native watersheds, our native forests, is that our forests are disappearing. And a lot of them have already actually already disappeared. So that's because of a lot of reasons. So a lot of the, these forests have burned. A lot of them have been cut down for the development and the houses that we see. And a lot of them just get damaged by animals. We call them feral animals. So those are wild animals that got out of captivity. So they're pets they got loose, farm animals that got loose like pigs, especially in deer and goats. And they go out and they eat these kinds of trees. And once these trees are gone, there's all of these other, what we call non-native invasive plant species that come in. So a big part of my job on the ranch is to try to take out and remove those non-native invasive plants and to replace them with native plants that are healthier watersheds and that are just better for the land. So what we're gonna to do today is we're gonna, I'm gonna show you how one of the ways that we help to rebuild a native forest and a watershed. Cause a lot of these, a lot of these places, they're huge areas. So it's really hard. One of the things we do is we plant trees like you would plant in your yard, but it takes a lot of money. It takes a lot of time to get something this big up into the mountains. We fly in helicopters and we can't bring a tree like this into the forest. It's just too expensive. So what we've been doing is we've been harvesting koa seeds. So these are koa seed pods that you can see here. And so we just pick these. These, these are a lot like almost like green beans, except they're brown and you pick them. And on the inside, there's a whole set of seeds, kind of like you'd see like peas in a pod. And in here, we take these seeds that are in these pods and we plant them out in the ground, but it's really hard also to plant these seeds directly into the ground because what happens is when you put seeds in the ground, birds will eat them and sometimes they blow away or they dry out if there's no rain. So we started playing around with what we call seed balls. And so we're gonna make seed balls today and I can't wait to work with you guys when we come back and in person, we'll get, this, get to do this together because it's a lot of fun and it actually really helps us uh, protect our watersheds. You know, it, we need to make a lot of seed balls 
to get a lot of forest to come back because um, each tree that you see up on the mountain started with a little tiny seed. So what we do is we take clay. So this is just clay like you see, like you probably do in art class. It's just a piece of clay. And then we take these koa seed pods. And this is just one of the species we use a lot because koa is a very important native Hawaiian tree. And so we take those seeds out of the pods and this is what they look like when they're out of the pods. And what we do is we combine the two. And there was a Japanese farmer that came up with this technique and it was just a really cool thing that we started adopting here in our conservation work. You know, one of the things I guess I should really say that I didn't is water's not important just to us to brush teeth and, and to, you know, to wash our cars and, and for us to be drinking because we got to drink about a half gallon of water every day. It's really, really important. It's key to agriculture. You cannot have agriculture without water and you can't have water without a healthy watershed. So again, the work that we do in land management is directly linked to providing water for agriculture, whether it's on Haleakala Ranch or whether it's a pineapple farmer or some other farmer down farming cabbage. It's really, really important to have a healthy watershed. So again, what we do is it's really simple. It's kind of just like making chocolate chip cookies. We take a little bit of clay, we take a little bit of seeds, and we just combine it just like you would do making chocolate chip cookies with your teacher or with your mom or with your dad. And we just combine the two and I'll make a big one just because it's easier for you guys to see, but we just roll it together just like that. And you have a seed ball. So this is quite a bit bigger than you'd normally see, but this is a piece of clay with a bunch of native koa seeds that we collected. And so what we do is we'll put these out instead of scattering the seeds on the ground where they might blow away or they might dry out or the rains might not come for like three months. This, the seeds will stay protected in this clay. So you know what happens when clay dries? You probably have done that, is it gets hard and that hard shell protects the seeds. And when it rains, maybe two months later, the clay starts to melt away, just like a piece of mud melts away. The seed gets exposed and the seed starts to sprout. And so we just throw these out on the land. You know, we throw it out everywhere and we try to put thousands of these out. And if we get, you know, some small fraction of those, maybe one out of 10 of these seeds actually takes, it's a, it's, it's a really cheap, fast, and really fun way to build a native forest in a native watershed. So we really look forward to you guys coming out and we can do this, we'll make thousands of them. You guys can play, you can get dirty. I really do miss that working with you guys. So looking forward to that pretty soon. My name is Jess and I work at the Maui Soil and Water Conservation District and today I'm up here at Haleakala Ranch as a part of the Maui County Farm Bureau Ag in the Classroom. So you might be thinking, well, what do I do? Well my job is to help protect natural resources. Now what's in natural resources? Well we've got all sorts of things like soil, water, air, plants, and animals. But today, we're gonna to focus on soil. Now, a lot of you guys probably know soil is dirt, but we scientists call dirt soil because it's actually a lot more than just dirt. Now, what's in soil? Soil is made up of all kinds of things. Lots of things that you see around here today. One of the most important things that's in soil is something called minerals. There are lots of really tiny rocks that come from the earth and make up a big chunk of soil. There's also water in soil. Even if it looks super dry, water is still a really important part of soil. There's also air in soil to fill up all the tiny little gaps. One of the most important things that we address in soil is called organic matter. Now organic matter is basically every living thing you see eventually goes into the dirt. And then when it decomposes and dies, it's reused. 
And that stuff is what gives life to everything you see. From lychee trees, to mango trees, to onions, potatoes, and tomatoes. Just about everything you know relies on soil. So soil is really important. Now, the next thing we're gonna show you guys is why keeping stuff on top of soil is important. Aloha, my name is Sabrina. I'm here at Haleakala Ranch for Maui County Farm Bureau's Ag in the Classroom. Um, so as Jessica mentioned, I'm going to be talking about, um, now that we know a little bit about soil, I'm going to be talking a little bit about what happens when soil interacts with rainfall. So here we have our rainfall simulator. We've got two different types of soil here, and what we're going to be looking at is actually erosion. Erosion is the amount of sediment that's coming off the land that's slipping away due to the rainfall that's happening. So we've got two different types of soil. The first one is bare ground. As you can see, there's nothing growing on this soil. It's completely just the soil itself. And the second type of soil we have is called ground cover. So this is soil that has something growing on the top layer of the soil itself. And we're going to go ahead and run the simulators and show you the differences between the two. And maybe you can guess which one has more or less erosion. All right, so the way the simulator works is we're going to um, pour water into this top layer and this little container has holes into it and it's going to allow rainfall to happen and we're going to create rainfall and then we're going to see what happens when the rainfall interacts with our soil. So as you can see, uh, with the soil on the bare ground, the water is easily taking the sediment off of the soil and it's completely silting it off into our container here. Um, and there's lots of sediment and the water is very murky and very brown. Um, so you may be familiar with uh, brown water warnings and this is kind of what happens when that occurs. So our next demonstration is going to be with this ground cover and we're going to see what happens when the soil and the grass interacts with the rainfall. So as you can see, as the soil is actually absorbing and creating kind of a filtration for our rainfall, the water comes off pretty clear and the soil isn't being silted off into um, our reef ecosystems and carrying all that sediment and nutrients with it. So now I'm going to be letting Kelly demonstrate a little bit about what makes up our soil and the different components in our soil. Hi, I'm Kelly and I work for the Soil and Water Conservation Districts in Maui County. I'm here to talk about different soil types and demonstrate to you a fun do-it-yourself at home activity that you can do in your own backyard. There are three main soil types, sand, silt, and clay. Sand is what you find at the beach. It doesn't hold many nutrients and it's coarse and dry. And silt is soft and powdery when it's dry and very slippery when it's wet. Now clay is very hard when it's dry and very sticky when it's wet. For the do-it-yourself at home demonstration, you can do this in your own backyard. All you need is a large jar with a tight lid, such as this, a handful of soil, or more than a handful if you have a large jar, and some water. What you're gonna do is pour the water into the jar like this and fill it all the way to the top without overflowing it, of course. Shut the lid tightly and shake it for like two minutes. And you're gonna let it sit for about an hour. You'll start to notice it settle a lot sooner than an hour, but you'll start to notice the different layers forming. 
this is what the final product will start to look like after a few hours. You can see the sand sits down at the bottom and the next layer is silt and then another layer above that is clay. Now this is the cloudy water where the clay is still trying to dissolve into the bottom. All of this is dirt and debris. After about 24 hours, the water will turn clear and you'll be able to see the layers forming much clearer. The importance of knowing your soil type in your yard um, is great if you want to grow your own garden or you're just curious about what what can grow in your yard. And that's it for the simple do-it-yourself demonstration. Thank you for joining us at Ag in the Classroom. Hey you guys, it's me and I'm back through the soil tunnel. Before I take you in here, I wanna show you what's on top. So just like I was talking about earlier, there's all these important things that soil grows in. We've got everything from crops, like these carrots here, everything you can find grown for food to eat. Then over here, we've got some forest land, just like all the trees you see up here today. And then we've got our water or the ocean, just like you see down there. So everything you see is always around us. We've also got our pasture land, just like we're up here today. This is where all the cows and animals feed and forage. And everything inside this soil tunnel is based a part of our ecosystem. So the next time we're with you guys, you can take a crawl through the tunnel with us. Bye for now. Hello, my name is Eric. I'm the coordinator for the Master Gardener program at the University of, of Hawaii Maui College. Um, obviously, we're all about plants, and today I'm gonna to talk to you about canoe plants, which leads us to the question is, what is a canoe plant? Obviously not a plant made from a canoe, but it has to do with the Hawaiians who first arrived here. Actually, they were Polynesians, they weren't Hawaiians yet, who brought plants and seeds with them in their canoes. Original voyagers, came here from the Marquesa Islands about 2,000 years ago. So they've been here quite a long time. They didn't bring much with them. They had to make do with fish and birds and whatever local plants they could find on the island. But the second group from the Society Islands, they brought plants and seeds with them to uh, improve their life. They didn't know what to expect when they got here. They brought approximately 27 plants and seeds with them. They also brought pigs and dogs and rats and jungle birds and all sorts of different animals like that to populate the island with. Obviously the Polynesians at that point didn't have much. There wasn't a Walmart and there wasn't a Home Depot and there wasn't a food land. So they had to make or eat everything. They had to grow on their own. Um, and they had no metal. There's no ore here to, for making metal tools. So if you think about it, all they had was wood and stone and they had to make everything else or grow it the only thing they could catch was fish. When they got here, they discovered very fertile soil, a mild climate, big forests, lots of fish, very, very rich, abundant food supply from all the plants that they grew. So the Hawaiians flourished and probably became one of the best Polynesian groups in terms of islanders that existed. The plants they brought with them, the guess, best guess is about 27 different plants is on this list here. A lot of them you've seen today. A lot of them are still currently in agriculture, are still being used. And when I go through them, you'll, you'll be able to recognize them. You'll see them in food land or growing on the side of the road. First plant I wanna talk about is Kalo. Everybody knows it as taro. This was probably one of their most used food sources. Um, we all know it as poi, right? 
but the leaves are edible too. You can cook these just like spinach, okay? So they use the entire plant. Um, in Aloy, where they would grow um, all the, t the uh, taro, one acre would provide three to five tons of poi per year, which is a lot of food. And you've all seen, because of the kanaka maoli, they used to gather to eat in a circle and they would make a poi bowl in the center. And depending upon how tart the poi was, it could be one finger, two finger, or three finger, depending upon how good it was. It's also medicinal, okay? They had no doctors or any of that sort of thing along the way. So they used to use it to settle your stomach um, they'd mix it with other things and treat boils and diarrhea and use it as a poultice on cuts and wounds. Um, it's a very, very useful plant. They never wasted any of it. This is a tree called Kamani. It's a very tall tree. It grows about 60 feet. They obviously had to use stone implements, which made it very difficult to utilize, and it being a very hard wood. But they made canoes. They made home parts. They made calabashes out of it, which are the big poi bowls. They made food bowls, trays, utensils, just about anything out of it. The beauty of the Kamani is it has no bad taste or odor, so it's perfect for food. It didn't translate any taste into the food that they put in it. And they also use the flowers for making lay. Inside the nut, there's a kernel that they could take out and it was oily. And the oil was used in a lamp. You could actually burn it and it was used to light things at night. Also, the fruit it had an extract that they could make a dye out of to color their tapa cloths. Everybody's seen the kukuis. Every time you go into the uh, parking lot at, at uh, the mall, you run over the nuts. Uh, you can see they have very beautiful flowers. Um, it's also a very tall tree, about 50 feet. They made all the same kind of wood products out of this that they used to um, out of the Kamani tree. And it also has a, a lot of oil in the fruit. Um, they used to use it for, for uh, lamps. They made dye with it. Um, what they used to do is take the nuts and they'd stick them in a row on a coconut frond and then stick the coconut frond in the ground and light one at a time. That one would burn out, they'd light the next one, literally. And the responsibility of children, in other words, you guys, if you were Hawaiians living at that time period, were responsible for keeping the candle lit. What they, would, they also had another thing. They would roast the kernels and the fishermen would pulverize them. And when they were out fishing, they were looking for fish. And if it was wavy, bumpy, and they couldn't see where the fish were, they put that pulverized oil on it and it acted like a piece of glass. The film for it made the visibility better so they could actually see the fish. Hawaiians were very smart people. Everybody knows what these are. Tea leaves, also called key. Okay, those are used still nowadays. They're used in religious ceremonies. You've seen these everywhere. The Hawaiians use them as a roof thatch to keep the rain out. Of course, lau lau, we all know what that's for. <laughs> uh, they used them as wrappers for food, for storage. Coke, sugar cane. We all know what this is. We've seen it come and go on the island for many years. The Hawaiians were very smart. They grew 40 different varieties of, of sugar cane. They used it to sweeten some of the medicines. And of course, you guys all know Haupia and Kololo. It's still being used the same as it was 2,000 years ago. Okay, Maia, banana. Everybody knows bananas, you see them everywhere. The Hawaiians had 50 different varieties of banana. They grew everywhere. They considered them slow growth and it was a, a take on patience. If you can grow a banana tree, you're considered a patient person. Of all these varieties, women were allowed to only eat two of them. And believe it or not, if they ate one of the other 48 varieties and were caught, it was kapu. They were put to death. Can you believe that? Yes. Yes, that didn't change until the 1800s. Next plant, milo. A smaller tree, only about 40 feet tall. All the wood products, utensils, furnishings, jewelry. The Milo wood itself is incredibly beautiful, so it was only for chiefs. Only the chiefs got to use Milo. You had to be special. The bark is also used for cordage. You could make a rope with it. Also dyes, oils, medicine, and gum. Noni, 
You can see the little green fruit on there. It's primarily medicinal, okay? It was used for all sorts of different things. Diabetes, heart problems, high blood pressure, wounds. You'd be surprised, but it has a lousy taste. So we know what to do with that, right? Go straight to the sugar cane. They used to sweeten it with that. They considered it the aspirin of the ancients. Good stuff. Ulu, you all know it as breadfruit, but actually that's a misnomer. It's an, actually a high carbohydrate vegetable that grows on a tree. Yes, yes. Um, you can treat it like a potato. You can bake it, you can fry it, you can grill it, you can stuff it. There's all sorts of good things with it. It's a very, very high carbohydrate vegetable um, that everybody likes. The wood is very lightweight. So they used to make drums, surfboards, poi boards, all sorts of different lightweight things out of it. Next on the list is Ula, also known as sweet potato. The Hawaiians used to grow 200 different varieties of these things. These and the um, poi were their main source of starch, believe it or not. You can see how easy. This one came sitting on the counter and it sprouted. All you have to do is cut it in half, stick it in the ground, and away it goes. I've been planting these in the garden out, the, out at the college down there, and if you cut one of these in half and stick it in the ground and give it about two months, it produces 10 to 15 pounds of potatoes. Yeah, and it has no care at all. You don't have to do anything except water it. So, very, very smart. Okay, and last on the list of what I have with me today is avapuhi. You guys know it as red ginger. Okay, you see it everywhere. It's turned into quite a commercial plant. Ginger is picked up by everybody everywhere. Um, the ginger itself, believe it or not, when the flowers bloom, inside the top of the flower, it gets this gooey, sticky kind of a mess. It makes a great shampoo and conditioner. The Hawaiians used to use it to wash their hair. And it's still used nowadays. It's smart people who know, when they see a red ginger flower, scoop it out, rub it in your hair. Um, I hope you enjoyed the lecture. I'm sure you guys have seen how important plants from 2,000 years ago are important to agriculture now. Bananas, sweet potatoes, the flowers, the breadfruit, all of those things we still use um, that are so important to us even after all this much time. Um, thanks for joining us at Ag in the Classroom. Have a good day. I'm a farmer at Bayer here in Maui, and I like to grow plants. Plants are an amazing part of creation and are beneficial to us in many different ways. Now, I've got my kids with me today um, somewhere. Oh, there they are. <laughs> and to help us discover some amazing facts about plants. Can you all think of some ways that we use plants every day? What kinds of ways do we use plants? For clothing. For clothing, yeah, like cotton. What else do we use plants for? We eat, yeah, food, yep. Yeah. And what about? Snap, <laughs> yeah, oxygen. Snap. Yeah, oxygen, yeah, plants make oxygen, that's right. Even the homes that we have, everything we use every day. So we're gonna learn about the different parts of a plant today and how we use them. All right, let's start with seeds. Can we eat seeds? Yeah. Yeah? What kind of seeds can we eat? <laughs> Well, and pecans, corn and pecans, and even rice. <laughs> That's right, all of these are seeds. And you know what's really cool about seeds is that these tiny little seeds have everything, all the information, all the food that the plant needs to make a new plant. And you know what's also cool about plants? They try to spread their seeds in lots of creative ways. So can you guys put, hold these? What is this? Yeah, show us how a dandelion works. Whoa, <laughs> yeah, that's right. All of the, the seeds travel on the wind. Each one of those tiny little things is a, is a seed. But you know what? Not all seeds are wanted in your garden or at your, um, on your farm, right? There are some seeds that, um, that we have that are stickers. Have you guys ever had a sticker burr in your shoe or um, on your clothing? Like, 
Yeah, they stick on you. I know, yeah. So those kind, those are ones that we don't really want, but that's a way that the plant uses um, people and animals to spread its seeds all around. So check out this one. This is a little hook and burr that, um, that is used, um, that people have used that design to create something cool called Velcro. You guys probably have seen this before. It's the same kind of design. It has little hooks and there's a little fuzzy part that it's kind of like your, your fur or your clothing. <laughs> so all of these are such cool ways that we can use plants. So when you plant seeds in the ground, what comes next? Roots, that's right. Yeah, they shoot out of the bottom, those little roots. What kind of roots do, can we eat? Potato and carrot. Whoa, those are and roots? Meat. Wow. And an onion, yeah. All of these are roots that we can eat. And even on this beach, we can actually eat the greens too. That's a different part of the plant. But, um, but um, what are those roots used mommy. for? Those roots are used for the plant to go reach way down and get water and nutrients and bring it up for the plant. But it also does something else for the plant when it's a really windy day. It gives the plant stability. It grows deep and makes them strong. So there's different kinds of roots. Like this carrot that you've got. This carrot is a tap root. It goes deep and it helps to prevent the drought. It can get water way, way deep down. But then there's this, these little fibrous roots that are also kind of small, these are, are um, for this grass plant. They have different purposes. So, but check out this kiave tree that I've got here. So on the farm, we've got some kiave trees and this one has roots that go all the way out to the edge of the tree. Can you guys see that? Wow, that is really cool. And yeah, the, the roots stretch way out to the edge of the canopy of the tree. And on the farm, we irrigate our crops with drip line. So that means we put drip line right to the spot where the roots are and we're not watering any weeds. And we even use these little solar powered controllers to turn the water on automatically. Pretty cool. But did you know that tree roots are so strong? Sometimes tree roots up country and on the roads, it can even bust up the concrete. Pretty cool. So what comes next after those roots? What comes up out of the soil? What can you see the here? Vegetable. No, a sprout. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, it's the shoot sprout. <laughs> it's the stem or a shoot or stalk of the plant, right? So that is this part that's sticking up out of the ground. But can we eat stalks or shoots? No. Yeah. Oh, what can, can we? What do you have in your hand? Celery. Celery. Did you know celery is the stalk of the plant? An asparagus. An asparagus. Yeah, you're eating the, the stem of the plant. And you know, we, um, we also, there's stems of plants that are called trees, that are called trunks, and that is the part that we use to make things like wood and paper and rope. So trees and, and stems are very useful for lots of things. And, but what, are, what do plants use the stems for? Well, plants use those stems to reach up above other plants and get, get closer to the sunlight. And it's also the highway that the plant uses to move water and nutrients up and down to different parts of the plant. So how fast do you think these kind of plants can grow? These little beans, these things grow like an inch a day. Can you believe that? An inch every day. So what if you could grow that fast? <laughs> you would be so tall. <laughs> well, we grow something on the farm that's pretty tall called bamboo. And bamboo is one of the fastest growing plants in the world. In fact, some bamboo can grow three feet in one day. So what do you guys think the tallest plant in the world is? The biggest shoot? Redwood! What? A redwood yeah. tree? Yeah. How tall do you think a redwood can, tree can get? 100 feet, 200 feet, 300 feet. What do you 300 think? 300 feet. 300 feet? Well, did you know that the 100. tallest, you think it's 100? Well, did no, you know? 400. 400, yeah. Well, did you know that the tallest redwood tree in California is over 380 feet? So you're right, it's almost 400 feet tall. And they're so big and so wide that you can actually drive a car through some of them in Redwood National Park.
All right, guys, so what grows next off of the stem? Leaves. Um, yeah. Hey, can we eat leaves? Yeah, yeah. What kind of leaves do you yeah. guys have there? Cabbage. Wow, what Cabbage. is this? Kale, yeah, this kale. is actually kale. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there's lots of different leaves we can eat. But did you know what leaves are actually for? The leaves reach up and they're trying to get something up in the sky. Sun! Yeah, that's sun. right, they're trying to reach the and, sun. And look, this one grows really tall. Yeah, <laughs> so they reach the sun and plants use sunlight to um, get energy from the sun to, to generate um, food for the plant through a process called photosynthesis. So the plant sucks up water from the ground and it takes in carbon dioxide that we breathe out like this. <sighs> and it converts that carbon dioxide in water to food for the plant and it creates something for us that we can breathe in called oxygen. Ah, thanks plants. So this, um, this is a cool thing. We can actually see this at home. If you take a leaf and put it in a jar of water and put it in the sun for a couple hours, you can actually see the plant making tiny little bubbles of oxygen on the surface of the leaf. And it's coming through tiny, tiny little holes called stomata where the plant puts the oxygen out and that's also where it gets the carbon dioxide. So there's another really fun kind of crazy fact about plants and their leaves. Venus yeah, the Venus flytrap. Did you know that plants, some plants can eat insects? Like the Venus flytrap. In fact, there are over 600 species of carnivorous plants that use their leaves to get nutrients from the insects they eat, just like the Venus flytrap or even the pitcher plant. All right, so what part of the plant grows next after the Flower. leaves? Flower. Yeah, that's right. So can we eat Flowers? Yeah. What? Cauliflower. Yeah. Cauliflower broccoli. and broccoli. Yeah, and there's even Wait, some no other kinds of cauliflower is called cauliflower. That's right. This is a flower. Yeah. And there's other kinds of flowers that we can eat too, like even a hibiscus or yeah. lavender. And there's some other things, but just ask an adult before you try anyone any of these kinds of flowers. But you know what? What are flowers used for? Flowers are the reprodu reproductive part of the plant that is used to produce fruits and seeds for the plant. So if you take a look at this hibiscus flower, you can see that the petals are this brightly colored part. Underneath there's a sepal, is this green colored part. And then there's also the um, stamen where the pollen comes from, these yellow parts. And then also the pistil at the very top um, the, actually, this whole long thing is a pistil, but the pollen goes to the very top and, um, and makes a pollination. So there's things like pollinators, like bees and butterflies, and the wind that help carry pollen from the pistil to, uh, I mean, from the stamen to the pistil. Um, so, and this flower smells good, but do all flowers smell good? No. <laughs> no. What kind of yeah. flower? No. What kind of flower doesn't smell good? It's something called a corpse flower, and it actually smells like rotting meat. So the bloom is huge. It's over eight feet tall, taller than the ceiling of our house, and it uses its stinky smell to attract flies to make pollinations. <laughs> so what do those flowers produce? Fruit, <laughs> fruit, yeah, fruits and vegetables. Yeah, exactly. So is fruit just things that are sweet, like bananas and apples and oranges? No, no. it's cucumbers and bananas. Oh, cucumbers and bananas. What else do you have? Tomatoes and avocados. Wait a minute. So you're telling me that a tomato and an avocado are actually a fruit? Uh -huh. Well, that's right. It's the fruit part of the plant. It's anything that's got a seed inside of it is the fruit part of the plant. Isn't that cool? So you know what the fruit is actually for? The fruit helps to the plant protect and spread its seeds around. Now, you know, if you're a hungry animal out in the woods somewhere and you find a piece of fruit, you chomp into it, you don't just eat the fruit, you end up eating some of the seeds too. And that plant or that animal then spreads those seeds around with a little bit of fertilizer to go along with them to get that plant started, right? So 
Um, but here's a fun fact for you. Um, did you know that every time you eat um, a piece of fruit like this, doesn't it, does it, does every banana you've ever eaten taste like all the other bananas you've ever eaten? No. No? Eat, when you eat bananas or oranges or apples, don't they always taste the same and look the same? No. no. What? They do. They do. <laughs> they do. They eat the same. Unless you get different varieties. But most bananas that you see in the store, um, except for like apple bananas, are this kind of banana called a Cavendish banana. And all these Cavendish bananas came from one single plant. Can you believe that? So um, they're all spread around the world by taking cuttings off of that same one plant. And actually this is how farmers um, propagate all kinds of different fruit trees is by taking cuttings off of that original plant and then spreading, and then spreading them around. Yes, and we can eat it. That's tasty fruit for you. Well, I hope you heard some things today that make you excited to learn more about plants. <laughs> if you want to learn to have even more fun with plants, just plant some seeds, water them, and watch them grow. In fact, we planted a few popcorn kernels in our backyard, and we got uh, two bowl, big bowls of popcorn out of it. Isn't that cool? Well, I had so much fun with you guys today. Thanks for joining us. Aloha. <laughs>
And things that we can kind of keep in mind is always to be observant about what the plants and fruit look like and where, where they come from. So we're going to play a little game here. And if you can follow along with me, we talked about a papaya tree. So papaya is a lot of times when you look at different trees, you can always notice that the type of leaves they have are going to give you the hint to the type of fruit they are. So when you think of a papaya plant or a papaya tree, I kind of think that they have leaves like crowns. So which tree do you think would be the tree with the papaya fruit? Would it be the one with a brown coconut growing on it? I don't think so. How about the one with this little banana thing coming out? Would that be the one? No, I think it's the one that looks just like this with the crown leaves. Another one we have here that grows right here is strawberries. And so strawberries, when you look and you observe, you can often see a strawberry plant has yellow flowers on it. So can you find the plant that has the yellow flower on it? And that would be right here. And so just one more, just for fun. You know, my kids love bananas. We can grow them right here on our islands on Maui, Molokai and Lanai. So what kind of plant or what kind of tree would come from a banana? Would it grow on the ground, do you think? Or would it grow on a tree? I think it might grow just right here and it gives us hints as to what kind of plant or tree it is. So I really thank you guys for having us here at this virtual field trip. trip. We Thanks. hope to see you soon in person next time where you can enjoy some fresh Kula Country Farm strawberries and Maui Gold pineapples. Stay safe, take care, and we'll see you next time. Hi, my name is Greg Friel. We're here at Haleakala Ranch and uh, we're filming for the Ag in the Classroom program that's sponsored by Maui Farm Bureau. Um, I'm the livestock manager here at Haleakala Ranch. Uh, I've been here since 1994. One of the big things I brought here when I came here was the use of stock dogs. They had never used stock dogs in the past. And uh, all throughout my career when I started out in the late 70s, we always, the ranches I worked on, we always used stock dogs to help us move livestock around. So um, I'd just like to show you a little bit of what these dogs are capable of doing. This is Trev, he's about two and a half years old. He's a border collie that I had picked up out of Australia when he was about eight months old. And um, he was started enough to know that he would work. And then, you know, he had very, very little training, but with the breeding that he had, he, he did have the, the genetics to, to be a working dog. And so I saw the filming of him uh, working a little bit as an eight month old pup. And then I bought him and shipped him over and then we worked with him from there. These animals, whether it's cattle or whether it's sheep, you know, they're herding animals and it makes it a whole lot easier for you to move them if they're in a herd and you can keep them together and trail them wherever you need to, whether you're moving pastures or getting them to a corral to do some processing or something. So um, just a little bit of like the basics would be something like this. Trev, come. Trev. Stand. So we'll put them in a corner like that. So over. So initially you just put them back and forth, teaching them what that word means. So that word over means for, hey, over means for them to go counterclockwise. Here is for them to go clockwise. So when they're young like this, you're just teaching them in a pen like this so that they understand that word means that direction. Here, at, hey at, at, at. So growling at them is kind of their, a punishment for them to react and get back into the corner. You know, it's not about the corner, but it's all about the corners. In the beginning, the corner is a place for them to settle down, think things through, 
He's an older dog, so he wants to just get in there and start working well. He's got to stop and think and put some brain work into it and not just be coming around and trying to move, move the stock around. Walk, stand. Here, up, here, up. Stand, over, stand, here, there, stand, over, over, there, stand, here, there, hot, hot, there, walk, stand, here, hot, stand, stand, here, hot, stand. Here, there, walk, stand, stand, get behind, get behind, here, there, stand, Trev, stand, oh, there, hot, hot, there, here, there, here, stand, over, there, stand, like the command there, they'll start on a, off on a direction, and when you tell them there, they're supposed to lock right, right in and face up on the herd that they're working, and so like when you're trailing them someplace, you can place that dog out, you can send them out, and you can place them someplace on the clock that will turn them in whatever direction you want them to go. Load up. Load up. When they're pups, we'll start them off on these buckets, and it's just a case of they're at ground zero, and then you know you, you walk away. Because puppies, when you when you get in them bonding to you, you walk away. They want to follow you and whatnot. <clears throat> but they're supposed to stay on that bucket, and they're not supposed to move. And so until you call them, <clears throat> and then when they get used to staying on the bucket, then you use the stimulus, the animals as a stimulus, where they will go around, and the dog is still supposed to stay on that bucket. <clears throat> if they jump down. You, you growl at them, punish them, get them back on top, and they realize that that is where they're supposed to be. That's when they, you know, that's when they'll get their praise. If they jump down and run away, you scold them and put pressure on them till they get back up on top and they find out that that's a safety zone. <clears throat> the reason why you do it up there and not on the ground is they make a move, they get down, it's very obvious. If they're down on the ground, <clears throat> and they crawl up five feet, ten, six feet, you know, 12 inches, you don't notice it right away. <clears throat> Excuse me. But when they get off of the bucket, you know right away what's happening. Trev. Walk. Stand. Ah. 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 Over. Trev. Over. Trev. Over, stand, at, at, over, at, over, there, here, there, over, there, Trev, there, stand, walk, stand, load up. He gets wound up working sheep because they're too, they're a small animal. You know, he's got to show a lot more respect when he's working cattle, especially cows and calves or bulls or something. But he gets wound up and racing around and it's, he needs to be disciplined. He, he's got to be straightened up and, and set straight to, you know, slow down and rate himself. But it's not for children audiences. There, walk, stand, 
here. Stand. There. Stand. Walk. Stand. Ah, Trev, stand. Ah, stand. Over. Ah, ah, stand. Over. There. Here. Here. There. Here. Here, there, over, there, here, hey, here, there. There, here, there, over, there, here, there, over. There, walk. There, here, there, over, there, load up. Good boy. So basically that's, you know, how you start. If you get them working in a small pen like this, then you start moving out to bigger pens and then going out into the field. And, you know, in fact, you know, the, the young pups, you start them off in an even smaller, smaller pen, about 16 foot by 16 foot. Then you bring them into something like this, that's about 40 by 40. And then you progress on to a bigger this corral. This is some and of the jobs out, that you out know, in these the pasture is stock working. dogs can help us with. Like I say, you know, we use horses to help us gather. We use the dogs to help us gather livestock. Find a job that you love and you'll never work a day in your life. Thank you.